Yeah, I don't I don't get too hard on folks about it because I understand that's what we that's what we've come up in. I shared some some history around uh, with some of my friends around Christmas and New Year's about what happens around there. A lot of a lot of silence. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Of yeah, that's that's normally the re the response, you know. Uh, you know, it's it's. I'm telling you, when you when you've grown up with something, and you know all your life, and you know you're asked to give it up then you really understand what sacrifice means because it's, yep. you know, your whole life is built around uh, those events. And so now you're being asked to give up something uh, that you've grown uh, accustomed to. Yep. Yep. It is, I've been, a, I've become acutely aware of how in greatly ingrained this deception as I was talking to two separate friends of mine from college and, uh, and both of them was telling me how hard it was for them to believe um, and they could easily see it, that it was true. They could read it for themselves. Uh, they could hear it for themselves. And they, but yet they, and I understood where they were coming from. They were like, it's, it's hard to believe because we've been told something so differently for so long. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. They did a good job on this, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're going to continue. Uh, to talk about uh, spots and blemishes uh, a little bit tonight uh, for the first part. And then we're going to go into uh, uh, talking about the timeline again. And we're going to use uh, Matthew 24 and Luke 21 uh, to do that with. Of course, we'll, we'll have to bounce around a little bit to get some clarification, but we'll start there and see if we can uh, put some things on that timeline. So uh, if there's not any pressing questions, uh, we'll move forward with the lesson. So tonight we'll talk a little bit about the, the, the era of Balaam. Uh, part of that scripture uh, that we looked at last week uh, talked about uh, Balaam. So Balaam, uh, you know, some call him a sorcerer, or, you know, he was practicing witchcraft or whatever. But as we were coming out of Egypt, uh, we were defeating our enemies, and uh, the king of, uh, of Moab, he got really, he, he was really afraid. And he was afraid, you know, because we had come up out of Egypt so strong. You know, Egypt was a strong nation, and we left Egypt decimated. And so everybody we came up against because we were walking with our God, you know, we were, you know, we were being decimated. So, of course, uh, Malak, uh, I think he was king of Moab, he became uh, very distraught. And so he contacted uh, Balaam. And he wanted Balaam to put a curse on uh, on the children of Israel. Now, Balaam uh, was known all around the region uh, because of the things that he uh, he could do. So he was real strong in, in, the, in that uh, in that area. So they all all of the kings of the other nations always seek his uh, his advice and his sorcery. So I just wanted to pull this map up uh, to show you uh, that you know just kind of a general um, idea of what the area looked like at, at that time. So as you'll see here to the left, you have Egypt, and as we traveled out, of course we went into the Sinai Peninsula. We were in that we were in that area, and then. Um, of course, we were traveling up and around Moab in the Edom area. And so this is where we had set our camp here somewhere in the plains of Moab. And this is where Moloch really got concerned. All right. So it says in Numbers 22, 1 through 6, it said that the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side of Jordan by Jericho. And the Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was so afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall uh, this company uh, lick up all that are around us, as the ox licked up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Beor uh, to Pethor, 
which is by the river, the land of the children of his people, to call him saying, behold, there's a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me, peradventure. I shall prevail and we might smite them that I may drive them out of the land for I was that he whom thou blessest is blessed and whom uh, thou cursed, curses is cursed. So they had a lot of respect for Balaam. And so they even give him uh, this line in, in verse six as if he is almost God himself. And they said, well, we know that whoever you bless will be blessed and whoever you curse will be cursed. So that's just how much authority uh, they gave him. So he went to do this and he sent back uh, to Balak that he couldn't do it. So then Balak, uh, you know, and he couldn't do it because uh, the Most High told him he couldn't do it. it you know, that he couldn't uh, bless those who Yah had blessed, or, you know, or, or cursed him. He, he didn't have that authority. So Balak sent more people back, even of higher authority, bringing more gifts. And so, uh, uh, Balaam consulted uh, with the Most High, and it was a it was a long discourse going back and forth. So I won't get into all of that. But eventually, uh, Balak went. To, Balaam went with Balak, to, and he uh, ended up blessing Israel three times. So Balak was uh, upset at this because he didn't get to curse. Uh, he didn't get to curse on Israel like he wanted. So in Numbers twenty three. Uh, 20 through 40, he said, Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he is blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shadow of a king is among them. Uh, God brought them out of Egypt. He has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, what has God wrought? So he, he lays this line up in verse 21. And he points out that one of the reasons that he, he can't do anything, number one, most high has, has commanded it. And then he said, he lays this line now, I really want you to think about it. He said, he has not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither has he seen perverseness in Israel. Now that line is important for what Balaam uh, is, is about to do and you know the council of Balaam so let's go a little bit further and look at this later on in numbers uh, Moses was fighting a war and he mentioned something uh, he was fighting against the Midianites and he was upset against the Midianites and it said that Moses was wroth with the officers of the host and with the captains over thousands and captains over uh, hundreds which came from the battle and Moses said to them have you saved all the women alive and he was talking about the women of, uh, of Midian and he said behold these caused the children of Israel through the council of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor and there was a plague among a congregation of the Lord now therefore kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman that had known man by lying with him but all the women, children that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourself. So this is the first clue in here uh, in the scripture about a council of Balaam. And so we had to figure out what in the world did Balaam counsel that would cause Moses uh, to be upset and cause Moses High to be upset. And so we had to dig a little bit further uh, to see uh, what they've done. So we go to Revelations 2, 12 through 15, he's talking to the church of Pergamos. And he said, unto the angel of the church in Pergamos, right, these things says he which has the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast thy name and has not denied my faith even in those days where in Antip Antipatus, Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. He said, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast there, uh, there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam 
who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So now this is the first time that the, the scriptures in, in the KJV anyway gets into what, what they actually done. So uh, uh, apparently just reading from this particular uh, text, Balaam knew that he could not curse Israel uh, you know, for Balak. And so what he told him to do uh, was to put a stumbling block in front of them. That, that there's nothing that any nation pretty much could do against Israel to curse them. But if he put a stumbling block in front of Israel and Israel failed for that stumbling block, then Israel would curse himself. And so he said, that's really the only way you're going to be able to get them is if they curse themselves because they have the favor of the Most High up on them. That's a powerful uh, statement that you can't get them, but they can get themselves. And so we're going to look at this a little bit more, but I just want you to see this. Go back to this, uh, what we had talked about. Uh, in Numbers, he said, he had not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perversions in Israel. So as long as that was true, there was nothing that anybody could do against Israel. But if we can cause Israel to have iniquity and bring perverseness into her own camp or in his own camp, he said, then we can bring uh, uh, disfavor among them with their God. And that's going to open up the door for us to defeat them. All right, so when we go into uh, Jasher, he goes in a little bit more detail about it. And he said, and the children of Israel approached Moab, and the children of Moab pitched their tents uh, opposite to uh, the camp of the children of Israel. And the children of Moab were afraid of the children of Israel, and the children of Moab took all their daughters, their wives of beautiful aspect, and comely appearance and dressed them in gold and silver and costly garments. And the children of Moab seated the, those women at the door of their tents in order that the children of Israel might see them and turn to them and not fight against Moab. So here they are, they, they take all their wives, they, they didn't care, their, their own wives and their daughters and they dressed them up real nice, all the beautiful ones, and they put them out so that uh, they'll be seen by, by the men of Israel. And saying all the children of Israel did this thing. Uh, all the children of Moab did this thing to the children of Israel. And every man placed his wife and daughter at the door of the tent. And all the children of Israel saw the act of the children of Moab. And the children of Israel turned the daughters of Moab and coveted them, and they went to them. And it came to pass that when a Hebrew came to the door of the tent of Moab and saw a daughter of Moab and desired her in his heart, and spoke with her at the door of the tent that was, which he desired. Whilst they were speaking together, the men of the tent would come out and speak to the Hebrew like unto these words. Surely you know that we are brethren. We're all the descendants of Lot and the descendants of Abraham, his brother. Wherefore, then will you not remain with us? And wherefore will you not eat our bread and our sacrifice? And when the children of Moab had thus overwhelmed him with their speeches and enticed him with their flattering words, they seated him in a tent and cooked and sacrificed for him, and he ate of their sacrifice and of their bread. They then gave him wine, and he drank and became intoxicated, and they placed before him a beautiful damsel. He did with her as he liked, for he knew not what he was doing, as he had drunk plentifully of wine. Thus did the children of Moab do to Israel in that place, in the plain of Shedem, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel on the count of his matter. And he sent a pestilence among them, and there died of the Israelites 24,000 men. Now there was a man of the children of Simeon whose name was Zimri, the son of Salu, who connected himself with the Midianite Cosby, the daughter of Zer, king of Midian, in the sight of all the children of Israel. And Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw this wicked thing which Zimri had done. And he took a spear and rose up and went after him and pierced them both and slew them. And the pestilence ceased from the children of Israel. 
Now, that's a lot of reading, but I want you to uh, see what they did. When, when Balaam couldn't curse the children of Israel himself, because he was uh, wanting the money and the, and, the, and, the, and the prestige and all that uh, Balak uh, was uh, trying to give him. He used his gift uh, to tell him, to give him advice on how to make the children of Israel fall. And so the Most High is telling us that these are spots. And he's saying anything that we do, any stumbling block that we put in front of people to cause them to fall, especially when we have knowledge uh, that this will cause them to fall. He said, then that's a spot. He says the major spot. And he, you know, he, he had them go in and, and, and destroy the camps of, uh, you know, uh, the, the Midianites. And he, and as you can see, he told them, don't, don't allow the women, uh, you know, kill all the women too. He said, man, they were involved. In, in making us fall. This was significant because the Midianites and the, and the Moabites had a, uh, had a pact, I forgot to mention that. So they were working together with this thing. And so uh, he said, kill all of them. He said, because they cause you to eat the sacrifices that made to other gods. They put all these stumbling blocks in front of you. And it goes back to what we had discussed earlier. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, uh, is, is uh, Christmas, a stumbling block? Is Easter a stumbling block? Are all these holidays that are not of ours that cause us to uh, bow down even unknowingly to other gods, are these stumbling blocks? And so, uh, you know, until we decide to, to get rid of some of our stumbling blocks, you know, that people have put in front of us, you know, it's going to cause us to fall. This, this, was so significant this, this event was so significant that this was the event that decided who went into the promised land i want you i want you to see this it, it goes back to the picture of of rewards and, and and all these things it was at this point after these things had happened that it you know it was decided that everybody that was 21 years or older would not be able to go into the promised land with the exception of two people, everybody 21 years and older could not go into the promised land. Think about that. They had to all die in the wilderness before the Most High allowed them to start to approach the promised land. So it was, this was a real significant event. It caused a plague and it caused, uh, you know, uh, some to be, you know, not, not be able to enter into the promised land. All right. So that's, uh, you know, when we start talking about stumbling blocks, we have to look at what type of stumbling blocks in our life do we put in front of people? Uh, you know, do we intentionally manipulate people to get what we want? Because that's what Balak, uh, Balaam, that's what Balaam was doing. He knew uh, what his advice was going to do, but he didn't care because it was going to advantage him. So do we do things that's going to, you know, give us an advantage. You know, I also look at, you know, some of the ministries around and they learn about the holidays. They learn that we're not doing things the right way. They learn of all these things. They learn who the real people are, but they refuse to go before their congregation and say anything because it's going to hurt their game. They might leave the church. Their, their money might not be quite as much. And so, they've got to give into account for the, you know, continuing to be a stumbling block for truth. And so it just, this category falls into so many different areas of, of our lives. And then we get to second Timothy and he's really playing off the same thought. So he says, uh, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of uh, their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to uh, the parents, unthankful, holy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false uh, accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pressures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. He said, for of this sort are they which creep into houses 
and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lust. Ever learning, they study your life, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. So this is the danger. He said they're always learning, they're always studying, but they never can come all the way to the truth. And then he used these two men, Janus and Jam uh, Jambres, who withstood Moses. So you can go all the way through the King James Version, and you'll never see these two names, Janus and Jambres. So you'll never learn who they are unless you go to some of the other texts. But when you go to uh, back to Jasher, then you'll figure out who uh, Janice and Jambres uh, was, and you'll see how it relates to this particular lesson. So when you go to Jasher 79, and said, when they had gone, uh, Pharaoh sent for Balaam, the magician, and to Janice and Jambres' his son. He said, for when they had gone. Now he's talking about Moses and Aaron had already confronted Pharaoh about letting the people go. He said, Yah's already told me, you got to do this. And so he shook Pharaoh. So he sent for Balaam and he sent for Janice and Jambres, his son. So Janice and Jambres was Balaam's sons. All right. And, to, and he sent not only to them, but to all the magicians and conjurers of counselors, which belonged to the king. And they all came and sat before the king. And the king told them all the words which Moses and his uh, brother Aaron had spoken to him. And the magician said to the king, but how came the men to thee on account of the lions which were confined at the gate. And the king said, "Before, because they lifted up their rod against the lions and loosed them and came to me, and the lions also rejoiced as them as dog rejoices to meet his master. And Balaam, the son of Beor, the magician, answered the king, saying, These are none else than magicians like ourselves. So, uh, you know, here's Balaam again, uh, you know, his sons giving bad counsel. And so in order to keep himself lifted up and to keep himself valuable, he minimized uh, the, the message uh, that Moses was giving. He minimized the message that said, I am, the, uh, I am that I am has sent me. The I am that I am has told me to come and release his people because it's important for him to release his people that they might come to me and keep the feast and meet me at a particular time and place. And Balaam, through his ministry, minimized the message. And so you see this all around. As we come, as we begin to wake up, as we begin to tell people the truth about what's going on in the word, they begin to minimize the value of what we're talking about. They begin to minimize, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, uh, we're all the same. But there's one people that he co he's coming for, that he's promised all throughout scripture that he's been trying to bring back to himself. And to minimize that is playing the part of Balaam and it's putting a stumbling block uh, in front of the people. And so this is, a, this is major. It's a major thing, you know, when we begin to talk about a stumbling block. It was a major thing uh, uh, when we when we talk about stumbling blocks, when Yeshua was uh, looking at the people when he was at the temple and he came through and he turned over the tables. They were being a stumbling block. People were trying to bring sacrifices so they could have a relationship with the Most High. And they wouldn't accept their sacrifices. They made them buy their, their animals and they, they would only approve their own animals. And they said, you can't, you can't, they couldn't even get to God unless they paid money uh, to the people that had to buy their animals. They had to get gain for themselves and people are trying to get to God. And so these are stumbling blocks, you know, and anything that we do to keep people from getting to the most high, it's a, it's a spot. Anything that we do, you know, whether we are men who want women to worship us. Uh, and I know this is kind of tough, but you know, when you run around out in the streets and you, you, you trying to get this woman and that woman, and you trying to get them to come after you rather than showing him, you know, I, I'm trying to get them to my bedroom rather than trying to show them to the most high. I'm being a stumbling block. Y'all get what I'm saying? And so the, the all of these things, 
he's showing us, you know, that we minimize our spots. And he's asking us to wash these things, get rid of these things, uh, let go of these things. So we won't be a stumbling block to somebody else. Now, the scary part of being a stumbling block, you know, if I'm in the way of somebody that he's calling, Y'all, I want y'all to hear what I'm saying. If, I, if I'm in the way of somebody that he is calling to himself, it's going to be easy for him to move me out of the way to get to whoever it is that he's trying to get to. So it behooves us not to be the stumbling block between somebody that he's calling <laughs> and himself. We should be a doorway and a passageway so that whoever's looking for him we can direct them in the, in the path uh, that, that, that they need to go. So, uh, you know, like we said last week, we talked about Cain. This week, we talked about uh, stumbling blocks, uh, knowing the truth, but still directing people uh, in the wrong direction for our own gain, for our own prospect. You know, and, and you know, and going back to the women thing, you say, well, how does that have to do with our own gain? Because I'm, I'm trying to satisfy my own lust with the woman rather than pointing her to to the most high. We see it in all these, we see it in a lot of churches now. We're taking advantage of the people that are trying to get to him, you know, and, and manipulating the people. So we don't want to be stumbling blocks for the people who are trying to seek out the seek out the most high. All right, so with that being said, uh, I'll open that part up for, for questions. I've got a couple of questions. Okay. Was it common for when people went to war for them to take the women? Is it, is, is it like they're trying to wipe out that nation or that people group or what? Is it common for them to occupy some place and then take the women and start reproducing? Right. Yeah, that was that was commonplace. Uh, for for most of the women, except for the Canaanites, they didn't want any of them to mess with any of the Canaanite women. It was, but yes, they would go in, and they would, you know, for the most part, they would have to be virgins, and then they would have to give them, I can't remember, thirty or forty days of mourning, to allow them to get over, you know, losing their their families and all that. So there was a there was an approach to doing it. But yes, when when they went in. Uh, the women were gained. Okay. And the second thing I have, I have a question about was Balaam. Balaam's been involved with Israel throughout the Bible, wasn't he? I mean, wasn't he on more than one occasions involved whenever we were involved in a battle or something? He was always kind of called to attack Israel or to do something with Israel. Yeah, Balaam, Balaam's council has been there for a while i mean so if you if you go look at the you read in the book of jasher he was there uh giving counsel against us you know i, I think when when all of the children were were being slaughtered you know all the babies were being slaughtered i'm thinking that was on his counsel i have to go back and, and look but yeah he's been giving counsel uh for a long time and then not only that but then his sons came along and they were doing the exact same thing So, Brother Kendo, may I ask, um, the world itself and all the things that have been done to cause a stumbling block with um, the world itself, you know, in so many ways, um, is it easy to say that, that it's been set up that way, you know, from generations? that causes God's people to, to not get to him with all of the stumbling blocks. As you were saying, like um, when uh, Yah told Moses to, to tell Pharaoh to let his people go because of all of the stumbling blocks. Can you agree with that? Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I, yeah, I agree in the sense that you, there's always going to be stumbling blocks. You know, uh, it's our responsibility to seek the most high 
so that we can take the blinders off so we can see the stumbling blocks. One of the, one of the things that he said in scripture was about people putting stumbling blocks in front of us, but we're blind and the blind is what ones that fall over those blocks because you can't see them. You know, or the willing, willingly, you know, overlooking the stumbling blocks and participating in yeah. them. You know, so the men, the men of Israel knew better because they, we had just been given the law. I mean, he had just brought the law down on Mount Sinai and it was so powerful that we didn't even want to hear uh, the Most High speak himself. We asked, to tell, could you just talk to Moses and tell Moses and tell Moses to come talk to it because this is too much. So we heard the word, you know, so we knew uh, the things that were going to cause us to stumble, but yet we ignored it. And that is what opened the door for the enemy to come in and wreak havoc in our camp. Yes. And then as, as well as like you were saying that we participated and then turn around and do it to our own mm -hmm. and causing stumbling blocks uh, to each other. Right. And not even being aware that we're doing it in the sense of causing a person or people to not seek God. You being deceived in that way, not knowing that that's what you're doing. Yeah, and that's, that's even more, uh, you know, and I mean, once you, if you got to take credit for knowingly telling somebody and then whatever you lied about takes root and it moves from one generation to the next generation and now you're responsible, I'm responsible for for that. I mean, that's even more detrimental. So that calls for a lot of repentance if we're really true to ourselves and each other to really repent of, of causing these stumbling blocks to not only our people but ourselves and to you know um you know just to causing the person to stumble and do things on for your own selfish desires right yes sir thank you you what share um i i have a statement and i guess a little bit of a question recently I listened to someone teach about the, the, the name and because we're talking about stumbling blocks, I think within uh, Israel with the, within the awakening, the names of Yeshua and Yahusha and, and Yahuwah and all of the names have been within just the awakening of Israel has been a major stumbling block. And, um, when you mentioned generations, that that kind of triggered me because I have a three-year-old granddaughter who I'm trying to, you know, teach the truth. I've been in the truth for three years. She's three, and I'm doing my. Her parents aren't in the truth, and I'm doing my best right now um, to, you know, to 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 teach her truths. And you have so many doctrines out here within the awakening that is, is, is becoming a stumbling block. And I, I just wanted to know your take on that as far as, I know you've talk, talked about it before, but have you any new revelation about whether or not it matters or not to say Lord or God or Jesus, or that you must speak once you have been um, shown the name, the true name, which I believe is Yahusha and, and Yahuwah, that's my 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 belief. But um, once you've been shown that name, you must always speak that name. That's some doctrine that's going out right now that I think will be a stumbling a block a stumbling block amongst our people in this awakening. Well, I mean, there's a lot of teachings that's there's there's a stumbling block, you know, uh, even within us. You know, I was doing some uh, reading on the different sects. Uh, you know, between the, you know, we had basic three different sects back, back even when uh, uh, Yeshua was uh, here, you know, and that was the Essenes, the Sadducees, Pharisees, you know, all three of them were in conflict about something, you know, they were, they were just, you know, and, and so even within those sects, there was division among each other in the, in the Pharisaical branch, among the Sadducees and among the, uh, you know, Essenes, what they weren't as divided as much on their doctrine except for uh, whether or not they should marry or not. So there was one sect that said, we sh we've got to marry because if not, we're going to die out, you know? So, uh, you know, so then it was the other sect that said, you know, that th that didn't want to. But as far as the other doctrine go, they were pretty tight on it. Uh, so there's always going to be 
uh, some division there. You know, I believe as we grow as far as his name goes and you learn more about his name, you want to use that name because it's more intimate. And it, it, it eliminates, you know, not from a, you know, not from a legalistic standpoint, but it just eliminates, it separates him from any other entity because you have people who are using, who are just saying in general, God, who are worshiping the devil. And then you have those who are saying they're worshiping God and they're worshiping the true and the living God. And so in order to differentiate which one that I worship, I use his name often. It, it, you, you get what I'm saying? Uh, as far as the pronunciation of the name, I was reading some texts back in the 13, from 13, 1400s. We were arguing then about whether it was Yahuwah or Yahusha and, 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 and Yahweh and, and, and uh, Yahweh. We were arguing then. The Spanish were laughing at us because we couldn't even agree on what name back in the 14, 1500s. So I understand the argument, you know, and he, you know, he knows that we're not going to get it exactly right. You know, even in the in the in the Jewish uh, or the Hebrew dialect, even in Africa, you'll have one group in one part of Africa that says it one way, and another group in another part of another African, another tribe that says it in a different way. They're they're addressing the same God, but the vowels might just be a little bit different. So. You know, are, are we saying that we can't we can't have a relationship with him unless we know perfect Hebrew? You know what I mean. So we have to, uh, you know, seek him based on on what we know. I know Yah is is common among everybody. Uh, that I know, and then we have to associate him with the truths of his word. That differentiate him from any other God, you know? And so once we attach those truths to him, then now we're, we're talking about the true and the living God. I can use his name and attach lies to it. You know, scriptures say that there's going to be one coming uh, in my name, but he's not going to be the real one. So he might have the right dialect, might be exactly right, saying it right, still the wrong God. So we have to know the information associated with our God to attach to that name so that we make sure we worship the true uh, and the living God. I hope that makes sense. Yes, yes, thank you. All right, any other? Uh... I have a comment. Okay. When I was uh, reading in uh, Matthew 24, and I was kind of amazed at how he <clears throat> referenced us to referenced us to sheep and goats. Mm -hmm. how, he, how he put the, the sheep on the right side and the goats on the left side. I was kind of amazed at how he, how he did that. Yeah, yeah, and it lines up yeah. with everything that we've been we talking about. It, 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 it lined right on up with it. And then. Uh, you, you start looking around at appearances and he says, is he trying to tell us something about sheep hair and goat hair? Right. You know, so... I thought about that. Yeah. So it's something to, something to meditate on. But yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, so in that text, that he, what, he's, what you're talking about, uh, he's going to come back and judge the nation based upon how uh, they treated Israel. And right. so that... And that's going to decide which of the nations are able to go into the 1,000 year millennial, you know, on earth. And those that have favored Israel would be those nations that get to enter into uh, the 1,000 year millennium. And the other ones, he, he's gonna, uh, right. he's gonna cast them out. So yeah, that's right side and left side. It goes with those uh, angels, uh, you know, that are with him on the right side and those who are not on the left side. Then he spoke on the beginning of sorrows. Mm. I kind of like I, like, I kind of like how he spoke on that as well. Yeah, we're gonna get a little bit more into that uh, tonight. Hopefully, uh, give it a little bit more understanding. Okay. I had a question about that about Matthew twenty-four. Okay. Um, 
um, verse 29. I'm just going to start right there where it says, right after the troubles of the days, this will happen. It talks about the sun becoming darkened and the moon wouldn't give us light. The stars will um, fall from the sky mm -hmm. and everything in the sky will change. And then when I get down to 34, he said, I assure you that all these things will happen while some of the people of this time are still living. So during that time, everything that he said was going to happen, he said some of the stuff was going to happen while they were still living, those people at the time. What are those things that happened? Do we know exactly what happened during those times? That's a great okay. question. Let's go ahead and uh, get ready to dig in, Matthew uh, 24, and then we'll we'll try to get to that and we're going to try to dissect that uh, out so we'll be able to see what's happened and what hasn't happened already. All right, so I'm going to share my screen again. We're going to go to Matthew uh, 24. All right, let me see. Before I get into Matthew 24, I wanted to cover the quick pattern right quick and then we'll, we'll get into Matthew 24. Um, there was a question asked last week about the the pattern of knowing whether it was a wheat harvest or knowing whether it was uh, another harvest. And so we know based up on um, the feast days what's being harvested. You know, the Most High said that um, that the that the harvest is the end of the age. So in order to understand the end of the age, we have to study the harvest to, to be able to put, put the patterns in. So the way the patterns are set up, uh, let's say it's uh, Passover, Passover happens, uh, then the next day is unleavened bread, and then that Sunday uh, is the Feast of First Fruits. All right, and so, these first fruits, they will have brought in the first part of the harvest. Normally, it's mostly barley because that's the first thing that ripens. And, uh, you know, they would weigh what you call the first fruits. The priest would weigh the first fruits and say, this is the first fruits of the harvest. If the first fruits of the harvest was accepted by the Most High, that, means, that meant that the whole field of barley was accepted by the Most High. So you didn't have to go out and inspect the whole field as long as you have a sample of that which was good. You know what I'm saying? So if that sample is good, the whole field is good. So, and that's why Christ is called our first fruits. He rose on the feast of first fruits. He became the first fruits of our resurrection. He presented himself before the Most High. And when he presented himself before the Most High as the first fruit, the Most High said, well, if you're good, everything that comes through you is good. Yeah, that's so good. And so he doesn't have to inspect. The most high doesn't have to inspect me and you because we're coming through Christ. Christ inspects us and makes sure we're going to be presentable before the Father. So this is what that represents. Well, the pattern of the feast was that when they waved it on the Feast of First Fruits, then he said, I want you to count for seven weeks, seven Sabbaths, 49 days. And then on that 50th day, you know, is Pentecost, all right, or called Feast of Weeks. It was also called the Feast of New Week or the Feast of the Renewal of the Covenant. So when Yeshua came and he became our first fruits, 50 days later, the Holy Spirit came down on Pentecost. All right, so we see a pattern, and the pattern that I want to look at is the 40, seven weeks or the 49 days. Then, according uh, to our writings, they would count another 49 days. And on the 50th day after that would be what they call the New Wine Festival, which is when they took the first of the, of the, of the grapes and they would crush those grapes and make new wine. Then you would have another 49 day cycle. And then the 50th day after that would be the New Oil Festival. All right, so this is the way the harvest goes. So when we look in scripture, we should be able to see in the last day, this same pattern happening. You see a 49, a harvest, 49, you know, 
in a, in a harvest. All right, so when we go to Baruch, we, when we were studying Baruch, we Baruch said it was going to be a couple of those cycles, right? But he said instead of days, these were going to be years, basically. So we see we see him instead of we see a count seven weeks, but we don't get forty nine days, we get forty nine years. Uh, and then we count another 49 week, uh, uh, instead of 49 days, we count 49 more years. And then the second thing uh, happens in Revelation. That's where we get our chart that we're going to be studying uh, these end time cycles. So does that chart make sense on the patterns that we're looking at? So this is the pattern that you're going to see uh, in the book of Revelation. So we'll refer back to this uh, more as we go on. All right, so we'll go ahead and go to Matthew. Now, the reason I, I sent the email out about studying Matthew and Luke is because Luke uh, specifically says that he does things in, in order. Uh, he says that in the first few verses of Luke. So uh, both of these events he, he talks about here in Matthew, he also talks about in Luke. So we have to go to Luke to see the sequence of things, you know, because it can be confusing here in Matthew. So let's look at, uh, let's look at this. All right. Um, Verse three, and he sat up on the Mount of Olives. Disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and, and, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All right, and all of these are the beginning of sorrows. All right, so when, I, when you read this, you're like, okay, well, what order does this come in? You know, where does this place, where does uh, the beginning of sorrows happen? You know, the, 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 the wars and the rumors of wars and all these. So then you go to, uh, you go to Luke. Let me see if I find Luke. And he's talking about the same thing in Luke. And he says in verse 8, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, Am I in the Christ? And the time draweth near, go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, and remember that word commotion, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilence, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering up to the synagogues and into prison, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. So he's talking to the disciples and he's telling them before the beginning of sorrows happens, before the nations rise up against nation and kingdom up against kingdom, before the great earthquakes and dire places and famous and pestilence, before all these, he said, they're going to lay hands on you, talking to the disciples, and persecute you delivering you up to the synagogues into prison, being brought before kings and rulers for my sake. So we see that happening to them. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Sell it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth of wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed by both, both by parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not have of, uh, of your head perish in your patience possess your soul. Now watch this. He said, when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation therefore is not. 
Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountain, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let them that are in the countries uh, enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And then he says this uh, in verse 24, and they shall fall by the sword, edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive in all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. All right. This is why this Luke is so important because he puts everything in order. And he tells us before, before all of the things happen that he's talking about, you know, nation rising up against nation and all that stuff. Before all of that, we had to have fallen by the sword and we had to have been led away captive into all nations. Well, that's where we are now, right? In all nations. You know, in AD 70, the Romans came in and we were slaughtered. You know, we either died by the sword or by pestilence uh, when, the, when the Roman uh, army came in. And then from that point on, we were sold into all nations. When you study our history, we were constantly being sold from that point on into uh, all the nations. All right, and so it's not until, and then he said that, that Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So now he's saying you expect to see Gentiles in the land until the fulfillment of all things. So when we go to Revelations, we see that the Gentiles are still in the land, even when the, you know, Antichrist get ready to, to come onto the scene. And it's right during that time that there's going to be a war with uh, with Persia, and the Persian king is going to go and and get uh, Judah and start bringing Judah back into the into the land of Israel, because Judah has to be there uh, for the Antichrist uh, to fight against. So, when we look at at Matthew 24, we always got to come to Luke 21 and see uh, how how the thing. So we had to be led away captive. After we've led away captive, that's when we're going to see the wars and the rumors of wars and all that stuff you know, after, we've, after we've been in the nations for a while. So that's where we're headed. And then we look at our timeline. Let me see if I can find the timeline. And the beginning of, and we start talking about the beginning of the commotions. Uh... This happens at C01 in the book of Revelation, beginning of commotions. So we started talking about the beginning of sorrows or the beginning of commotions. We're talking about that first seal in the book of Revelation that happens in Revelation um, uh, 6. All right, now uh, go ahead and uh, lay T and follow up with that and make sure that I answered your question. I want to make sure I, I want to lay that groundwork, but I also want to make sure I answer your question directly. Um, well, I guess in like in Matthew, when he's telling them what's going to happen, like the sun will be darkened and mm -hmm. the moon will be will not give light. The stars will fall from the sky and everything in the sky will be changed. And so, like I said, when you go to 34, he said uh, he's telling them that some of these things are going to happen while um, some of the people are still living in that time. And I was trying to figure out, well, what are some of the things in that time that he said was going to happen already has happened? Okay. okay. Yeah. All right, good, good. Okay, so I kind of captured uh, the question. All right, so what happened at that, at, that's already happened is, uh, and, and it's gonna happen again when you read scripture, but it's, it's already happened as well. It's that we fell by the edge of the sword in Jerusalem. Now we're not gonna be led away captive again, that's already happened. So that's not gonna happen again. But um, the Antichrist is gonna uh, tread over Jerusalem for you know three and a half years under his rule. But that'll be his last three and a half years over the nation of Jerusalem. So yeah, we uh, for the most part, you know, when the Romans came in, uh, we had to flee. Um, the the signs and the stars and the moon and all that stuff has they that that's not happened yet. 
So when he said the sun be darkened, the moon, and all that stuff, he's pointing to the fact that uh, the, well, let's just go to Revelation and I'll show you. Okay. Why are you doing that? I just want to throw this in there. Okay. So when he said the sun would be darkened, does that have anything to do with, with, I mean, we've had times where the sun didn't, was darkened by the eclipse. Right. Does that mean right. that or? No, nah, this is, he, he's pointing to a particular, uh, okay. Let's look at, let's look at the, these scriptures right here. Uh, can y'all see my screen on that? No, hold on. All right, so here's a few scriptures. When he said the sun and the moon shall be darkened, let's look at some things that we can reference so we'll know exactly where we are with the sun and the moon dark. All right, uh, let's go to Isaiah 13 first. All right, um, let me see. We'll just start with uh, the burden of Babylon, uh, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for my anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as a great people, tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. So he's talking to us about the battle. All the nations are upset and they're gathering against basically the Most High and his people. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. How ye? For the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction for the Almighty. So now he's talking about the day of the Lord. So keep that in mind. Therefore shall all hands be faint and every man's heart shall melt. This is uh, also terminology kind of used in the book of Revelation. And they shall be afraid, pains and sorrow, birth pains. Uh, that's what the beginning of sorrows, when you look up the terminology, beginning of sorrows, uh, it, 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 it says birth pains, like the birth pains of a woman. And said, so they shall be afraid. Pains and sorrows shall take hold of them, and they shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed at one another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. He shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. And watch this. For the stars of heaven and the constellations, therefore, shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogance of the proud to cease and will lay low the hardiness of the terrible. So he's in this text, he's likening the darkening of the sun and the moon uh, to the day of the Lord when he's, he's gonna punish the whole world for the evil, the other nations for their evil. Uh, at this, our punishment will be ending and he'll be turning his wrath back toward uh, the rest of the world. So when we see this terminology, we'll look at a couple other ones. Uh, the moon and, and the stars shall be darkened. Understand he's pointing to the day of the Lord. And then we'll look at our timeline and see exactly when we think that this is going uh, to happen. So for the stars of heaven and the constellation shall not give their light. Now, what, what are the stars of heaven? Right, that's how Sherry's mouth moved. I didn't hear it, but she said angels. And she's exactly right. So the angels uh, are, you know, when he says stars of heaven, and I show you in Revelation where he, you know, he he mean he he's defining the stars of heaven as being the angels, and he said he's gonna cast the angels down out of the sky, out of heaven, down to the earth. So that's they no longer will be given their light in the heavens because he's gonna cast them down to the earth. So this is just terminology that he's using to explain the casting down of those fallen angels uh, down to the earth. Uh, and so we just got to figure out when that's going to happen. So let's look at, uh, so we, we, so, 
Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So when you say the stars are actually the um, angels that he's going to cast down, which I know that. So has that happened at some point? Has that happened once? It happened to a few of them, yes, but but he's talking about like the the const whole like the constellations you know all, the whole of the constellations of me you know um, okay. let's go let's go look, let's go look at revelations okay, so yeah. looking at that, Ken, do I have a question okay so are the stars of heaven just the fallen angels period so all the stars we're looking at are just the fallen angels they're not just angels in general they're just the fallen ones that's a good question. I don't think so. Um, because, uh, let me see, let's see what the, what the scripture says, a reference. I don't think that the stars of heaven are all fallen, no. But there's going to be a great war in heaven. So in Revelation 12, it said, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon up under her feet and under her head, a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travelling in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast in the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as it was born. And that's the reason I answered the question, uh, uh, Patrice, about the stars. It, it could possibly be, but it appears to me right here that it's, it's the third part that he drew a third part of the stars with him. And it says, she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Her child was called up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled in the wilderness. And this is where we got to go back out in the wilderness where he, she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there 1,203 score days. And then there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels. Uh, these are the good angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So there was no place for them anymore in heaven. So he get cast out. And the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he is but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. So he's going to persecute Israel uh, again. All right. And this is when he fights Judah. All right. And then to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she was nourished for a time, times and a half time from the face of the serpent. So we escape and we're nourished in the wilderness uh, again. Uh, and this is where the gathering of Israel, uh, you know, is taking place, where we're all meeting uh, in the wilderness again. And then there's going to be a war. All right. So it's a little different from, you know, maybe what we've been taught. But so when we see these uh, stars fall from heaven, then we go back to our chart again. I wanted to say something too. Okay. Um, the reason why I'm bringing this up the, this way is because um, I've, the way we've been taught, and I've also been listening to some teaching, mm -hmm. they're teaching it as none of this has ever happened, and we're waiting for everything to happen. And I kind of seem that's hard to believe since the word is way over 2,000 years. You know, so it's like, People are like, okay, none of this stuff has happened. We're waiting on it to happen. So we got time. The way it's being taught is like we, they're still waiting for everything to happen. And I say that cannot be true because 
the word was written so long ago, way over 2000 years. And, um, but it's not being taught that way. And that's why I was asking that some of these things have happened already. It's going to happen again. Or is it going to happen for the first time? But when I read Matthew and he said that some of those things were going to happen during their time, that's when I knew that I don't know what happened, but I knew something had happened during that time. Right. And I, I don't want people to believe, you know, I don't want to be talking to people and they thinking that, okay, none of these things has ever happened. We waiting on it to happen. Right. You know? right. I, I mean, I understand. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of teachings going on out there and, and I'm telling you it can be confusing. That's why I try to I try not to just speculate on stuff. You know, when he talks about the harvest, I go back to the scriptural harvest to talk about the patterns of the harvest, the order of the harvest, how the harvest went. Because he's not gonna do anything this the next time that he didn't do before according to the pattern. That's what he said in the book of Ecclesiastes. So he said, I'm not, you know, everything that's ha going to happen has already happened. There's nothing new under the sun. So we can always go back and look at the patterns and, and see how he did it. And if the harvest is the end of the world, then we got to go back and study the harvest that he gave us. And there's patterns associated with those things. And um, so, yeah, there are some things that have happened. And, th and then so we look at Luke to see what has already happened. And he says, he tells them that they're going to go before a king. They're going to be slaughtered. They, these things are going to happen. People are going to hate them. Well, we know that's already happened. He said, then, uh, you know, uh, Jerusalem is going to be trodden down. We were going to be slaughtered. Well, we know that happened in AD 70. After that, he said, then you're going to be dispersed into the whole world. Well, that we know the, the uh, diaspora has happened. We're still all over the whole world. So we know that those things happen. So he said those things have to happen before the beginning of sorrows happen. So if we're still out in the world, dispersed, how can, you know, the beginning of sorrows have happened, you know, before the, the, the diaspora, you get what I'm saying? So the diaspora had to happen before the beginning of sorrows uh, happens. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've always believed that some of the stuff had already happened. And like you said, nothing new under the sun, so it's going to repeat itself. Right. But because we're in a different time, it's gonna, is it going to be different? Because we're in a different time now. And according to um, the world ending, is that the end of an age? Right, the, right. It, it, the world, the word "world" that he uses, and there's the end of an age. Okay. So the end of this age, you know, he's telling us that the beginning of of sorrows or the beginning of commotions happens uh, with the blowing of the of the trumpet. Uh, it begins uh, when we hear, or you know, I hope to be there, but you know, when this crowd is in heaven and it begins to rejoice, it said that the whole world will hear the rejoice or hear the voices rejoicing before the throne. So everyone in heaven, everyone on earth, and everyone under the earth, and in the sea, everybody's going to hear it. So we'll know when the beginning of commotions happens, or the beginning of sorrows. It's using the same terminology for this first seal in Revelation as when we begin to talk about the beginning of, the beginning of sorrows. All right. Does that make does that make sense? I, it's a lot in this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Elder Kendall. As yeah. as as far as what they may have witnessed already in the skies, is Matthew 27, 45 sort of addressing that a little bit? It says now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Is that sort of the same thing that they may have witnessed back then? Uh, that's a that's a good question. Yeah, um, you know those those are signs in the heaven. I personally believe that there are going to be uh, another a group of signs in the heavens that's going to blow our minds away. Uh, you know, when we look at um, when we look at the events in Revelation, and we see. 
let's say in C in CO6 right here, so we see some stars fall. So that's that's where you're gonna see some angels coming down to Earth at that particular time. All right, we're gonna see a sackcloth moon and blood. We're gonna see mountains and islands falling into the sea. It's gonna be a lot of crazy stuff that we're gonna be looking at. And some of these angels that, that are coming uh, back up on the earth will claim to be the Messiah. Okay, and they're gonna have great power and they're gonna be able to show great wonders and they're gonna make a lot of people believe that they themselves you know, are the Christ. And so these are the type of things that we're going to see. Just like when we go back to the book of Exodus, we see all of these giants. And when you look at all of the nations, the, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Canaanites, they were led by Nephilim or giants. You know, that's going to happen again. You know, the, these nations are going to be led by uh, these entities because they're going to be, you know, uh, showing that they are their gods. And these are the great sights that's going to blow men away. And he said it's going to be so strong that even, you know, if it were possible, that even we would be fooled by it. You know, that's how strong it's going to be. So when we look at the terminology on our timelines and we see the beginning of commotions here, you know, or beginning of sorrows, we see that then Baruch is called beginning of commotions. And then this is when the first seal comes out in the book of Revelation. So all these things begin to line up. And then we see the wheat and the barley uh, harvest starting here, but we don't see the wine harvest start until uh, later on, you know, around about this time. So. Kendall, I had, um, I had a boss many, many years ago um, you would be having what you thought was casual conversation with him mm -hmm. and you'd be enjoying the conversation. Then maybe a couple weeks later, you see him again and he would ask you about, you know, have you done something that he was mentioning and what you thought was casual conversation? I mean, just the way he would talk to you, you didn't think he was issuing a, a directive. Mm -hmm. and, 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 mm -hmm. and I realized uh, that I, I go back and reread the Bible, you know, with the intention of just looking at it as best I can from God's perspective, because uh, the deception uh, that is that is prevailing and will prevail, it it is it, it is such that we won't even know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's that's how that's, that's how bad it, it will be, and and unless we understand, unless I understand what God has said in his word from his point of view, if I treat the Bible as just a casual conversation, which is how it's all, you know, it's, it's been presented that way to me for years. You know, I, you know, I was, you know, Lady T brought up an excellent point. Lady T 007, James Bond's friend, um, in Matthew 24, that, that, that scripture in, um, I think it was verse 30, 34, um, where is it? Where is that scripture? Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, the, the, the way that has been presented over the years, I would have never thought that um, Jesus was talking about generations in terms of a race of people. He was talking about a specific group of people, and and I have to you know, I have to remind myself that this whole gospel. You know, when Jesus sent out his disciples, he told them, don't even go to the Gentiles. This is for the lost sheep of Israel. You know, it's, it was intended for a specific group of people. It was intended specifically for us first. And I, and I have to go back and, and remind myself, uh, I have to go back and remind myself as I reread, you know, that God has a point of view and I should be trying to read and, and understand from his point of view and be aware that, you know, there's some other points of view out there that, that are not, that are not right at all. Right. And, and that's what keeps me grounded because when he says something, he, I know it's somewhere else. He's already explained it or given the information somewhere else. Yep. So when he says he explains the harvest, okay, well, I mean, we were an agriculture nation. 
And that's all he talked about with us was the harvest. You know, he explained himself to us through harvests and through planting and through sowing and reaping. That's how he explained himself to us. So when he comes into the New Testament, he says something like the harvest is the end of the world. Oh, okay, well, I need to go study what the, what the harvests are that he's been explaining to us in this book that, that the, that the uh, well, I'm not going to call him any name, but the other people say doesn't matter anymore. Right. We don't need we don't need the old testament. The old testament doesn't matter. But you can't understand what he's talking about in the harvest unless you go back to the uh to the to the old way. You can't understand all of the prophetic aspects of what he's revealing to us in the New Testament without understanding what he concealed in the in the in the uh in the old. So you're exactly right. We have to look at it from his perspective. What have you been trying to tell us all of this time? And so you know, looking at this harvest, and then it goes back to that, that verse where you're talking about, he said, this generation. He said, well, what generation? He said, that fig tree. When you start seeing the fig tree uh, blossom. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's the fig tree? So now you got to go back in the Old Testament and figure out who the fig tree is. Mm -hmm. And so then he, he starts relating the fig tree to our uh, fathers, mm -hmm. right? Okay, well, then you say, well, what does that mean? Well, then it says that, uh, you know, Elijah will come on the scene and turn the hearts of us back to the Father. You know, so when we start believing the same way that our fathers believed, who were considered to be the fig, he said, that's when the fig tree will begin to be fruitful and to blossom. He's talking about our belief system. That, that makes sense. So when you start talking... When you start talking about the fig, the fig shows up with Adam and Eve. You can't eliminate none of this stuff. The fig leaf was an indication of a false belief system. Whoa. Because they thought that they could cover themselves with figs and fool the Most High into thinking that they had something that they did not. <laughs> And so from that point on, the fig became a symbol of the fig leaf itself, just by itself, with no fruit, became a symbol of a false re religious system. Okay, so when Yeshua shows up in the New Testament and he walks up to, he's hungry, y'all. He's no. <laughs> y'all get what I'm saying? So he, he sees the fig tree from afar off. Yes. <laughs> And it had leaves on it, just like Adam and Eve. It had <laughs> leaves on it, and he said, this way he said, and he walks up to it and it had no fruit. And That's he said, why he killed it. He killed it. He said, you are lying to me. Mm, mm, mm. I came to reap a harvest off of you, and you were, you were faking like you had something, but you had nothing, and he cursed it. See, so the fig itself is a fig leaf itself is is a picture of a false religious system. So so when he's so when he says that learn the parable of the fig tree when his branch is tender, now he's talking about when we're coming back into the true belief system. And we know who we are and we're beginning to follow who we are and we're being taught who we are by the hundred and forty four thousand and the two witnesses and Elijah has turned our hearts back to the Father. He said, when y'all start seeing this happen with the real folk, he said, then you'll know. That generation right there, they're not going anywhere until you see all of these things happen. So, so we go back to your original point. Everything has to be put from the perspective of the Most High. It's got to be. Yep. All right, so. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the great deception that is out there that it can be from another point of view. Yeah, and, and it can't be. That, that's the deception that, that it can, you know, and, and it's not. You know, when when people try to put the some of the prophecies that's only related to Israel, us, on themselves as Gentiles, it throws everything off. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, Amen. Brother Kendall. Mm-hmm. Um, after listening to the explanation of the parable of the fig, when, when I, that wasn't a parable, I'm sorry, 
when Jesus cursed the fig tree, I asked several people what how to interpret that. And, and finally, I get an answer that makes sense. So thank you so much. My other um, comment is that could the great deception also be that we haven't been taught anything about the Jewish culture and Jewish traditions to understand the harvest because we're no longer an agrarian culture. And when I talk with people about, you know, we should be looking into the holy days instead of these holidays, which we celebrate, started celebrating because that's our American culture. I was kind of, you know, taken aback because they said, well, we're not Jewish. Well, the thing, that's part of the, I mean, you're right, but I think it's deeper than that. Okay. I think it's, I think, I think it's meant for us. I mean, our enemy want us to be deceived. If that's they don't, that's they, the point I'm saying. Yeah, yeah they don't want yeah. us to know who we are. Exactly. They, they want to teach us bad doctrine because bad doctrine keeps us from, it's the, 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 the doctrine of Balaam that we talked about earlier. Let me put something out there, a stumbling block. If we can get yes. these men to sleep with these women and eat our food that we have uh, sacrificed to other gods, if we can get them to do that, it destroys their strength and their power. Well, that's happening today. That's happened. That's the, and that's the point. It's happening now. And so when you when you talking to people about uh, Saint Nicholas uh, or Saint Nick right. and 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 it's it's a satanic uh, thing. And, and the it, Easter Bunny and, and Easter all of, and all of those things are associated with <laughs> satanic things. And we say, if we say, well, it doesn't matter, then we're 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 deceived already. Amen. To say that it doesn't, and so we're eating the food of 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 uh, that's been sacrificed to idols, and, and we're sleeping with the. I mean, and so yeah. it takes away. It takes away everything. And so then we find ourselves, uh, you know, marrying and mm -hmm. sleeping with women who will never believe what we believe or supposed to believe. So our desire for them outside of our belief system keeps us from developing into who we need to be. You know, and that's what happened to Solomon. You know, he brought in all these strange wives with different belief systems who would not never change their belief systems, never stop worshiping their gods. So he compromised and he messed himself up as well as his nation. So um, we think it doesn't matter, you know, because that's what they teach us is, is grace and the rest of it is all right. And so we fall for that. You know, and so, but when he says stuff to me, like, be ye holy, you know, like I'm holy, is that just grace and do what you want to do? I mean, come on, you got to explain something to me. You know, what, what are you trying to tell me? If you're trying to say be holy, but at the same time, you can do what you want to and it's all right. You know, there's got to be some, some kind of distinction in there somewhere that you got to draw some lines somewhere. You know, when, when I read scriptures where he say he's not going to share his glory with no other gods, he's not going to put his, his tradition, you know, allow other traditions uh, to come in. He had to share it with some other God. And then you read the December 25th is shared with all these different gods. And you telling me that he's going to share his glory with the other God. I mean, come on, y'all. You know, he's going to share his resurrection with another God on Easter. Really? All right. I mean, if that's what you say. But I read in scripture where he said he wouldn't. And that's why he set his day so he could have his moment, he could have his glory, where he fulfilled his thing on his day, and nobody else can mess with that day but him. So that we would know who he is, we would know the work that he was going to do on those days. He even gave us the songs that would be sung on the day when he was going to be riding in on the donkey. So that we would know when he came that that's him. But then we say, oh, it don't matter. I don't buy that. It matters. So, you know. Brother Kendall, when you made the, the statement, I well, you quoted the scripture from Isaiah 42 and 8, I will not um, give my glory to another. 
I've heard people justify celebrating many holidays. And they say, well, no, God knows my heart and God gets the glory out of everything. No, he doesn't. Amen. No, he doesn't. I, no, he ooh, doesn't. He doesn't get the how are you gonna get the his how glory? How you gonna get the glory out of Halloween? That's right. my point. You know, I told a friend of mine the other day, I said, you know what? I said, you know, you asked me these questions. I said, but you married. I said, and saying your birthday, I said, let's say your birthday July 7th. I said, but every year your wife wanna celebrate your birthday on August 5th. I said, and then you find out later on that the reason she cel wanna celebrate your birthday on August 5th because her ex-boyfriend birthday was August 5th. <laughs> I said, you going to feel good about that? I said, but yet, you don't want to share your birthday with another dude, but you want the God that you serve to share his with a, with a devil. Oh, come on now. Y'all know what I'm saying? And so, you know, he has certain times that he <laughs> set aside so that he could get the glory. I told you I was coming on Passover. I told you I was going to be nailed to the cross at 9 o'clock. I told you I was going to die at 3 o'clock. I told you I was going to be stressed out wide. I told you there were going to be three crosses. I told you I was going to be, it was going to be done outside the camp. I told you all these things. I told you that the shank bone can't be broken. I told you all these things. And we could go on and on and on. And then I came on on that day and did it exactly like I told you I was going to do it. So that I could get the glory for prophecy because my testimony is the spirit of prophecy. First, I tell you what I'm going to do, and then I show up and do it. So I can get the glory and all the honor. Amen. And then yeah. we decide we're going to change it, and we talk about our heart. As if our heart is more important than his, uh, his commandment. Okay, and so... You know, the thing about our heart is that he comes to correct us. You know, the woman at the well had a good heart, but her worship was wrong. He kept a good heart, but he corrected her because she was directing it in the wrong place. Y'all get what I'm saying? So he's, he's going to correct our worship. He's not going to allow us to just do anything that we want to do because then he won't even call it worship. He won't even hear it. He said, I know you're trying to do it right, but you got it wrong. He said, you worship, but you don't even know what you're worshiping. So if she didn't know what she was worshiping, she wasn't worshiping him. She was worshiping some other entity and didn't even know it. He said, but if you're going to worship me, it's got to be in spirit and it's got to be in truth. What did I tell you ahead of time? What did I tell you about this situation ahead of time? So that when you when I come to confirm who I am, that you said, well, yeah, you told me that about 3,000 years ago. Yeah, that's you. You know, so he's not going to do anything that he hadn't already showed us prophetically. And so that's why I teach from a prophetic viewpoint. He shows us patterns in the harvest. That's exactly how he's going to do it when he comes back. He shows us patterns in the feast days. That's exactly how he's going to do it when he comes back. You know, he shows us worship in the temple, but that's his, you know, when we when we do it the way he wants to do it, that's how he's gonna have worship in the temple when he comes back. It's he's not gonna deviate from those things. And so people make up their own doctrines, but he gave it to us. So it's up to us to have the faith to believe that he's that powerful and that awesome that he can write it all down thousands of years before he comes. And then come later on and fulfill it exactly the way he wrote it down. You got to ask yourself, do I believe that? So we started talking about feast day and we started talking about the harvest. We go, if we count 49 days and on that 50th day is a, is a, is a, is a completion. Then he count another 49 and then there's a completion. Well, I just happen to believe that that's exactly the way he's going to, he did it before. That's exactly what he had us set up, and that's the, exactly the way he's going to do it again. And so when I look in the book of Revelation, it lines up perfectly when you, when you look at it the way that he, he looks at it. All right. I, I went on my, my rant, so. Um, I got a question. Yes, sir. Um, talking about the, the 
the deceit and how do you <clears throat> how do you deal with it and try to learn from y'all without reading the Bible? Because there there are, there are people who believe in him, but have those thoughts and beliefs that since the Bible has been stepped on and changed so 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 much throughout generations that it's misleading them or misguiding them. So how do you discern between the two or how do you get over that hump? Well, I mean, he, he I, this is where I, I, I approach it. I know that there are things that have been changed. And, but the things that they change are the obvious things. Right. I, I want you to get what I'm saying. They're so obvious um, because they don't have the spirit to be able to see the next level of prophecy. So the things that they left unchanged verify truths that they would never see until it's too late. Uh, you, you get what I'm saying? So so when we, you know, and that's why, you know, when, when I was writing the book about Adam, the, the next level of prophecy says that Adam is a picture of Christ. You know, that he fell asleep in order to bring forth his bride, that he was pierced in the side and a part of him was brought out that she might be formed. The inference is that Adam died for his bride. When you look up the word sleep, word sleep it's, it's used in, the, in a different form to figuratively say he died. So he figuratively died to bring forth his bride. He was pierced in the side like our Messiah was pierced in the side. He was wounded like our Messiah was wounded. He shed blood, that's the inference, like our Messiah would be. You get what I'm saying? And he did it through through figurative death. Now, anybody who's trying to change scripture wouldn't see those pictures and those shadows and those types because the, it's not obvious. Only the spirit can reveal those type truths. So you can't change what you don't know. So the word has been altered in some areas, but it's up to us to seek those things out. And he shows us that prophetically, he hasn't changed. He hasn't allowed any changes in the prophetic level, on the prophetic level. He just has not. And because he, they don't know that it's prophetic. If the enemy had known that the lamb all the way through scripture was a picture of Christ, he would never have crucified him. You get, you get what I'm saying? So if he had known for 1,500 years that the priests were going in and at nine o'clock in the morning and then at three o'clock in the evening they were saying it is finished they would have never crucified christ because he was on the cross and they nailed him to the cross at nine o'clock in the morning and then at three o'clock in the evening they said he they said it is finished and he was up on the cross talking about it is finished they wouldn't have never done it he they wouldn't have never messed with it because but they didn't know that that scripture was that they were talking about him you get what i'm saying so on the next level of prophecy there's no way that the enemy can change those things Right. So whoever is, is trying to seek him has to do what scriptures say, ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find knock, and the door shall be opened for you. You got to show that you are serious about seeking after him. Those that come after me must first believe that I am, mm -hmm. and that I am a rewarder, listen to this, of them that diligently, not, not half-heartedly, I don't read. I don't study. He said, I am a rewarder of them that diligently seek me. Y'all get what I'm saying? This is not a half-hearted, you know, I'm going to barely do it. I might talk to him. I might not and get revelation type thing. Don't worry. Right, but, but, but if you have that mindset that the Bible is a collection of stories put together of experiences with y'all. And now, since you have that mindset, now you, you your mind is thinking like, well, who gave them the right. authority right. to write write these things down and commission these things and say, hey, this is, this is that, this is what, 
you know, who, who gave that authority? Right. And that's the enemy creeping in, uh, you know, creating these stumbling blocks. You, you get what I'm saying? So right. that just the thought process itself sets you up for unbelief. You, you know, when we minimize the word like that, it sets us up for unbelief. When I study the word, I study it from the from the standpoint of I'm going in knowing that he set this thing up for me to seek him out. I'm going in there knowing that everything points to him. I'm going in there knowing that he has a prophetic plan for uh, for his people and he's already established and laid it out. So for me, it's not an issue for me to see something because I go in already believing it before I even read it. You, you get what I'm saying? So, but if I go in with doubt, right. I'm blind already. And so we we have to uh you know look at it from that perspective now whoever it is with that mindset the lord will have to deal with them on that level and and show them who he is and his power and all, all of that you know but you know i i the whole word from my when i look at the word is talking about him that's what i see that's what i believe my whole heart even if i don't understand it he just hadn't opened my eyes to it yet but the whole thing is about him. Yeah. Can I say something, Kendo, for a minute? Okay. I'm about to burst. <laughs> First of all, thank you for sending us the material that you sent us. Because Judy and I are studying the, um, the first book of Adam and Eve. That opens up so much. Because when I used to read the Genesis period, it was almost like I was reading a summary of things and not all the details. When you start reading those other books, it really starts going into detail of the nature of Satan, the nature of God, how Adam and Eve were thinking, all of that stuff. It's amazing that it opens up a whole new, just a whole new view of how you see things when you read those other books because it fills in, it fills in the spaces. Even like with the, like what we were talking about, how Adam was, how he dealt with God and how God dealt with him and talked with him. It makes a huge difference when you start looking at the other books as well to fill in the empty spots there. Because for me, when I was reading, it was always like a summary that I was reading and all the details were gone. It's like someone just reached there, reached through there, took out the details. Reading the other books that you gave us makes, it fills in all those empty spaces for you to where you get a more complete story. Right. And, and uh, you know, when, when you look at the KJV, when you look at the way, not necessarily just KJV, but just the way that the Most High set up the Pentateuch or the first five books, he did it in a certain pattern so that we could see his plan set out in a certain way. So he, he intentionally left out details so that we could find the pattern. I hope that makes sense. And then he put the details in other books so that when we search, when we want to know why and this and that, we can find it in the other books. But the, but there's a pattern that happens uh, in the original book that he's trying to show us uh, about his plan. That's why he writes it a certain way with Moses. And then he goes out and branches out with the other books. So that's the reason I love the, the Pentateuch because the patterns that he shows us. Okay. Uh, and so he doesn't want to bog us down with the details because of the pattern. And I hope I hope that makes sense. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Hank, did you have some? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Corey, I really appreciate Corey's question because I've, I've had to uh, deal with that same question uh, in the last few weeks. And you know, you know, Kendall, you had mentioned earlier that you start referencing that scripture that stumbling blocks will will come. Well, it goes on to say in that, that scripture that woe be t is it to those who call stumbling blocks to come. And he says it's better to have a millstone tied around their neck than, and be cast to the, the bottom of the sea, causing my least ones to, to become offended in me. And, and, and so, and just when you, just when, I, you know, someone would want to think, okay, well, the reason I feel the way that I feel is because of the stumbling block that's been put before me because people have gone through over the course of time and changed the Bible. Just when you want to feel like, okay, I got an excuse, then you say, you make this comment, well, it's up to us to make sure. You know, the, you know, the Bible tells us in Matthew 
you know, when they ask him the question, when is all this stuff going to uh, happen? The first thing that comes out of uh, Jesus' mouth is, be not deceived. You don't be deceived. And then he goes on to tell them all this stuff. And so, you know, it, it's it's a it's a you know it, it's a it's a problem for those people that's causing the stumbling blocks. But we still have a responsibility. And and and, I, and for the person I had to address that question with, I just have to trust that the Holy Spirit is going to deal with them about that stumbling block and help them to navigate around it if they have a heart to believe in Him. Yeah, man, you just said something. I mean, the, the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. Uh, yeah, yeah, y'all, y'all get what I'm saying? I, I'm telling you, and that's where our trust has got to come from. When we're seeking these things out and we're asking him, I, I, I'm asking, okay, Lord, what does this mean? What does this mean? And I go seeking him, and, and I'm asking, and he showed me something, then I go back and ask again. You know, it's a process. But if it's half-hearted, I mean, you know, most of us yeah. seek, seek out our wives, uh, you know, a lot harder than we seek out to the most high. You know, we, we, you know, she turned me down the first time and let me go holler at her again and see, see what, what she going to say. And then we'll, 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 we'll take out and we'll, we'll, we'll try to get on the date and we'll try to buy this and we'll try to buy that and we'll try to do this to, to get her focus to come to us. And we put more effort into, uh, you know, getting our wives or our girlfriends or whoever, whatever, than we do into trying to get the attention of our maker. Y'all, y'all hope y'all hear what I'm saying. And so if we'll put that effort or more into uh, going after him, because he said he's jealous, right? If, if, if we go after him with, with, with the same uh, type of zeal, he'll open up our hearts and open up our minds to his thoughts and his ways. You know, but why would he? You know, why would you reveal your secrets uh, to somebody that's sleeping with somebody else? Uh, I, I hope that makes sense. You, you know, so if if you if you sleeping sleeping with somebody else, why you want that woman to, to trust you and tell you stuff? You know, she's scared you might go off and tell that other woman. <laughs> So, uh, but anyway, we cannot. But um, brother Kendall, um, um, can you can we agree on the greatest deception that the enemy has done us through religion? Oh yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, through, like through all religion, that is to me it seems like that's the greatest deception. Yeah, you know, and then I was reading. I think it's in. Um, I think it's in Second Baruch. I see if I can find it. I I get Second Baruch and Second Ezra. Some of the things I find in those uh, mixed up sometimes. But I'm thinking of Second Baruch. He said that he gave them a religion, uh, the the pagans a religion that they would flock to. <laughs> he said he said because he knew they would never be his, but he gave them a a religion that they would see and they would flock to, and they would love it. He said, who, who's he? Who, who the, most high. the most high gave them a religion oh. that they would love and flock to. Okay, the problem is that we we got caught up in it and we loved it and flocked to it too. Oh. So we that's why he said we got to come out of her. Oh. We got to shake it loose. You know, that's not ours. Oh. And we got to learn the differences between the two or the five or whatever, you know, however many other religions it is. Because what they do, they do like Satan did in the garden. They mix a little bit of truth with, and all you got to do is th- throw a couple of deceptions in there. And you got us. Baylock, all you got to do is get them, put them beautiful women outside the tent. That's all you got to do. And then have them dressed up real good and blinking real good and, 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 and looking real good. When they walk up, you know, see what happens. So we fell right for it. Went in there, ate with them, drank with them, got drunk. And before you know it, we got pestilence going all through our camp. Twenty of some thousand people dead because we went in there and, and compromised our belief system. Then we compromised our belief system. And now uh, everybody 21 years and older can't even go into the promised land. They got to die out in the wilderness. Because Why do you think he picked the age 21? You know, I don't know. I don't know. So that's, a, that's another debate, though, because it, well, she was just talking about the, the great deception uh, religion. 
I kind of kind of believe it's that lust demon. That that that, that flesh, that the sexual demon. I believe that's that's one of the greatest ones right there. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. That's been from all yeah. day one. From, from the beginning, ain't it? Well, yeah, uh, yeah, because Adam 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 covered his wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and he, 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 he chose that flesh over, over, over y'all. And think about it like this, too. In every, every one of those false religions, uh, sex is one of the main things inside a religion. So they right. use that, yeah. They use that even on the uh, altar. You know, they would, what they would do, you know, with Easter and all that stuff, they would impregnate the, the virgins on the altar on Easter. All right? Nine months later, the the babies would be born, right? And then that would be Christmas. All right. But three months after that, they would take they would they would sacrifice them same babies that they had 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 had, had made on Easter. They would take them same babies and sacrifice them on that same altar that next year on Easter and take the blood of the babies and paint the eggs, Easter eggs with that same blood. And then impregnate some more virgins on the altar on the east again and continue that same cycle. Y'all yeah, yeah. <laughs> get what I'm saying? And just so happened the birth of the 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 god, you know, Zeus and Baal and and uh and, and these other gods, their birthday just so happened to be nine months after Easter on December twenty fifth. Now what are the odds of that? And yet we want to say that our God was born and sharing his glory with Zeus and Baal on December 25th. And he's okay with that. Yeah, he all right with it, ain't no problem. Even though he said that he would be conceived during Hanukkah, that he would be born on the Feast of Tabernacle, that he would die on Passover, that he'd be resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. He gave us all of these prophecies that of what his work was going to be but we ignore all that and say no nah, my heart my heart says christmas all right even when he brought them out even when he brought us out of egypt even at mount sinai they they created a whole nother god and, mm -hmm. and, and knew he was there knew yeah. he was with them. and put his name on it create the yeah. new gods and put the name yahweh on the new god <laughs> but you know why, 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 why is that? It just it's over the course of history, you know. There seems to be this reoccurring issue that Yah has never been enough for us. We've always wanted to have something else in addition to Him. Right. I can to answer that, Hank, to yeah. answer that, Hank, I believe like like <clears throat> we needed something to see and believe in instead of. Thinking he was there, we needed something to actually see. But during those times, he did he did appear during those times before Yeshua came. He did appear to them a lot, you know. And that's what I, I was the question I had uh, a couple of weeks ago was like, how come it wasn't enough? You well, know, and when his he visitations, his visitations back then was more frequently. I can't. I'm, I'm just going with what I know. More frequently back then than they are now. Well, it so, seems like it because of what how we read the scripture. Mm -hmm. It seems like it. And he made a he made a visitation with us in the wilderness. Of course, he was ever present in the temple and, and all these things. But uh, when you look at uh, like during the, you know, when you go read like during the time of uh, Eli and Samuel the prophet and all that, it said that the word of God was real yeah. scarce. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we weren't hearing from God as much. They, they saw when, when he did something, it was big, but it, it wasn't like he was just always doing something, you know. Uh, so I understand what you're saying. You know, when we're reading it, it seemed like, well, he was just doing all these, all these things. And, what, what, and then we had to ask ourselves, what do we call a miracle? What do we call, you know, you know it, it, I mean... Well, because I mean, because to me, you know, the fact that I I woke up this morning, how did I do that? You know, I'm inhaling and exhaling. That's a miracle all by itself. What is air? 
Can I create it? Can I create air? Can I create oxygen? Uh, my own thought. Uh, who gave me that? Mm -hmm. I, I had a friend that was in a wreck, and and he can't walk no more. He, 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 but I can put one foot in front of the other one. How did I do that? How can I manage to stand up and put one foot in front of the other? All these things, because they're common, we don't look at them as miracles. But it's not until they're taken away that we realize it's the power of the Most High that enables us to do all of these things. I see, I hear, I taste, I feel. You know, all these things are miracles that we don't think of as 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 miracles. If I cut myself, I heal. <laughs> yeah, y'all gonna say how how does all those things happen? So uh, I, I think our perception of him has been dulled. But you know, we, we've always been like, even in the wilderness, you know, he, he was there with us, a cloud. Yes. <laughs> he yeah. was there with a, 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 a sun, a moon. He was always there, a quail, manna. Yeah. But yeah, as soon as Moses goes up to the mountain for a little bit and come back down, now you got this, this, this golden image. <laughs> What's wrong with us? I mean, he pardoned the sea. Well, well, Stiff neck people. Yeah, what that's a great question. What is wrong? <laughs> with us? I think it I think it is it's something that we want to be able to control. As humans, um, like God Almighty, we can't control him. We are leaning on him and we're waiting for him to move to inform us. But when when we want as we want to control everything. So in order to do that, we create our own God that we, even though we bow down and we talk to it, it can't do anything for us. We control it. See, that goes back to, that goes back to Cain wanting, wanting uh, praise for his sacrifice. Mm -hmm. wanting, wanting God to, to, to accept his sacrifice for his work. It goes all the way back. It, you got to everything you just said. You got to take it back to Cain because it, it's it, it, it's Cain wanting wanting y'all to to accept his work, right? And then it goes back to kingdom principles and stuff. And we'll get ready to close out unless we got some more discussion. But the kingdom principle is that you know y'all made uh, almost made. It's like he made a rule that says what I do, I'm going to go through the authority that I gave on earth. So he gave Adam authority and he said, I'm going to work through you to accomplish the things that I want to accomplish. I'm giving you the authority. So I'm not going to just go in and do it. I'm going to do it through you. Yeah, it's, a, it's a kingdom, it's a kingdom type uh, principle. Adam messed up and gave the authority over to the enemy. And so the Most High had to keep finding, or he would go keep finding that one man that he could work his authority through, through uh, on the earth. Y'all get what I'm saying? So what he's saying is that he can work through us because I never understood why he would tell me pray. And because I was like, you know everything, you got it under control. Why do I have to pray? I, I just didn't understand the concept to get something done. And he said, because I'm working through you and I need you to give me the authority to work. Mm. I hope that makes sense. And so once I pray and ask and open up the door for the authority for him to work through me, then he works miracles through me on my behalf. Y'all get saying Because he gave us the initial authority. So you know, and that's why he said pray always, you know, so, you know, we got to stay so that he can work through us. He wants us to, he wants to work through us and establish his kingdom through our hands. Can do you know prayer literally means to exchange wishes? <laughs> no, I didn't know it meant, I didn't know it meant to exchange wishes. That's exactly what it means. It means to exchange wishes. <laughs> so he's telling us then, by exchanging wishes, <laughs> yeah, that it's a it's a it's a will that he wants done on earth, but he want to do it through us. Mm -hmm. So he had to wait four thousand years from his other first son Adam 
to work his will through his second son or his first only begotten son, Christ. And because he had that one son mm -hmm. who he worked through his complete will, you get what I'm saying? Now, you know, he, he can reestablish his authority back, back on this, on this earth again. So it's, it's, it's a lot to it, but man, I'm telling you, that's why he wants us to be walking in authority as, as sons, uh, giving permission to him to work through us to accomplish his will on earth. Thank God for being born again. That's uh, uh, all this, uh, our natural instincts and, and uh, always looking at other uh, gods and idolatry. Uh, even coming out of Egypt, like you, like everyone was saying, uh, just thank God for Yeshua, uh, for being born again uh, of the Spirit, uh, because these are spiritual things now, and um, we're not captive to to the the carnal man just do, you know doing anything that our instincts call for. But thank God that we have the Spirit who's in us. Uh, we're new creations in Yeshua. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We thank you that we're that new man. You know, uh, uh, just praise God and thank him. Praise Amen. the Lord. Just a comment. Just a comment. Okay, so what I'll do for, for next week, I'm going to try to take a little bit more Luke 21, Matthew, and put it on the chart. We'll take another uh, look at that and make sure that we kind of, you know, at least got an idea of where my thought process is and if you know, you disagree, that's fine. We discuss it and then see see if we can find the evidence to back, you know, back up our thoughts. And so we'll we'll go from there. It doesn't have to be what I said. You know, let's look at this thing. You know, he may reveal something to you. Let's talk about it. So uh any more questions or comments? Man, this was good. One. This was good. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, this is good today. <laughs> I have one, I have one, one one question for you, Brother Kendall. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you said um, so, Heavenly Father said one day to him is a thousand years to us, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think we're in the fifth day or the sixth day, like? Because it's you know everybody always says I always hear. Um, yes, you was here 2000 years ago. It's, it's been more longer than that. So, are we like in 5,000 years, which would be the fifth day to him? I, I believe, you know, and I've been studying, I've been restudying. Um, I'm glad you brought that. I've been restudying the, the, the length of times and the different books about how many years from you know, uh, the recreation, not the creation, but the recreation until now. And I do believe, I used to say it was 4,000 years from Adam to Christ, but I do believe now it's 4,000 from the, from the uh, advent of around the flood until Christ. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's what, you know, bringing out all the other texts and all this stuff, mm -hmm. you, you know, does because the ages, I believe in the beginning of the King James versions are wrong. Mm -hmm. because uh, the, the Septuagint uh, version has a different one and a couple other versions have different ages. But we'll get into that another time. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that there's there's been 4,000 years from the around the flood until Christ, and then there's been 2,000 from Christ until now. So that's six days. Okay, because I was studying Adam and Eve, the book of Adam and Eve, and in there he told them that he will, that he had created a body for himself and he will be back to give them. When he put them out the garden, he told them, he said he will be back to give them in five and a half days. Mm -hmm. And Adam and Eve thought that meant actually five and a half days. And he came back and said, no, 5,500 years. Yeah, and that's one of the texts uh, that I'm talking about. So that's not the only book that says that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we'll, we'll look at that, but it's like, two or three other books that says the 5,500 year that it was 5,500 from uh, the recreation until the advent of Christ. And so they went back uh, and counted those years and they broke it off into segments. And uh, it added up to around 55. And then I was reading uh, uh, in the book of, uh, well, not the book, it was uh, just a historian, Josephus, and his calendars kind of lined up with what that calendar was. So I had right. to go back and rethink, okay, well, well, when did he start that 
four thousand years that, that we were talking about. So uh yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah, but yeah, but a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years, you know, is as a day, you know, with us. Okay. Well good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any more uh, comments for we yeah, like like Hank said, it is good and it's hard to part, you know, with especially if you got questions, but we do have to we do we do have to stop at some point. We'll go all night, but um, maybe one day we'll set up a special uh, uh, Shabbat session for, for those who want to just do like a, a morning uh, conference or something. We'll go. We'll set up, but we'll we'll go for a few hours. You know, we'll we'll go an hour or so and take a break, come back, you know, do it again. So. Uh, y'all send me some emails on those what your thoughts thoughts is on that and then we can we can spend a little extra time you know one day um all right well let's say a prayer and get out of here uh father we just want to thank you for your love we want to thank you for your sacrifice we want to thank you for revealing to us and answering our questions you said ask and it shall be given seek and you shall find and knocking the door will be open lord you, you're keeping that promise you're opening up doors you open up our minds you open up our hearts you're giving us the, the, the desire to change into what uh, you want us to be. And we ask you, Lord, not to leave us, Lord, to keep working with us, to keep being patient with us, keep molding us and shaping us into what you've caused to become. We ask you to go into every household that's represented here. We ask you to anoint every member of every household from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. We ask you to reveal yourself unto all of us, and reveal yourself, reveal your truths, and help us to walk in your ways. And we just want to thank you uh, in your son, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, then. Amen. All right, shalom. 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 Have a good evening. You, you too. too. You too.